Brothers and sisters, good evening. Welcome. Welcome to the service tonight. Welcome to the beginning of Holy Weekend and this experience of Good Friday, which we call Tenebrae in our tradition, the service of darkness. Before I say any more about that, I just want to offer the levity of a reminder that tomorrow morning at 11 o'clock, we're going to host our community Easter egg hunt. And so we're excited about that and hoping that any of you who is able to be a part of that event can come and be a part of it, whether you're coming to search for eggs or to greet families and kids as they come or to help set up in the morning. I know that a bunch of us will be showing up sometime around nine o'clock, maybe a little bit after nine to uh, begin setting up. So Kevin's done great work uh, to get us ready to go, and we're going to have a really fun full day tomorrow. So I hope that you can join us for that. And if you're not able to be here, maybe send up a prayer in the morning that everything goes well and smoothly, and that we're able to connect with some families and show them the hospitality and love and care of Jesus Christ here in our community. Tenebrae is the opportunity to remember through scripture readings and songs the story of the passion of Jesus, these final events leading up to the trial and passion and crucifixion and final breath of our Lord and Savior who went to the cross to die on our behalf. So I hope that as we are gathered, as we are worshiping tonight, as we go through these readings, these reflections, these prayers of confession, God's Spirit will move among us to connect us back to this incredibly important story in the movement of our faith. It's a heavy service. It's a heavy remembrance. They were heavy events. And yet, even in the heaviness, we call Good Friday good for a reason. God was doing something remarkably redemptive, loving, and grace-filled to secure salvation for us through the sacrifice of his son. It's been part of God's plan from the very beginning, and we can be here tonight with grateful hearts, thinking of the love that God has for us who would sacrifice an only son, that we could be with him in this life and forevermore. So let's take these next moments in preparation and let's ask God in prayer to be with us as we worship. Let's connect our spirit to God's spirit. Let's set aside the distractions of the day and of the life leading into this time and be ready to give God the fullness of our attention, our reverence, our awe, our love and respect as we worship the God who has given his very best for us this evening. Let's prepare for worship. Times of darkness, times of darkness, times of lament are no less a time to worship. And so would you please join with me in our call to worship this morning. When darkness comes and it seems the Lord has forsaken us, we cry. Why are you so far from helping me, so far from the words of my groaning? When we cry to God by day, but receive no answer, and by night, but find no rest, we say, do not be far from me, for trouble is near, and there is no one to help. Save us, O Lord. We will tell of your name to our brothers and sisters. In the midst of the congregation, 
we will praise you. Our first reading this evening is from the book of Luke, chapter 23, verses 13 to 25. Pilate then called together the chief priests, the leaders, and the people, and said to them, You brought me this man as one who was perverting the people, and here I have examined him in your presence, and have not found this man guilty of any of your charges against him. Neither has Herod, for he sent him back to us. Indeed, he has done nothing to deserve death. I will therefore have him flogged and release him. Then they all shouted out together, Away with this fellow! Release Barabbas for us! This was a man who had been put in prison for an insurrection that had taken place in the city and for murder. Pilate, wanting to release Jesus, addressed them again. But they kept shouting, crucify him, crucify him. A third time, he said to them, why, what evil has he done? I have found in him no ground for the sentence of death. I will therefore have him flogged and then release him. But they kept urgently demanding with loud shouts that he should be crucified and their voices prevailed. So Pilate gave his verdict that their demand should be granted. He released the man they asked for, the one who had been put in prison for insurrection and murder, and he handed Jesus over as they wished. First, conf first confession of the evening. Oh, Jesus, we have rejected you and the one who sent you, abandoning the one you tread, denying the truth you teach, despising the life you offer. So now we climb to the place of the skull and confess, we have prepared a cross for our Savior.
two others also who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. When they came to the place that is called the skull, they crucified Jesus. There with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots to divide his clothing. And the people stood by, watching. But the leaders scoffed at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself, if he is the Messiah of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, This is the king of the Jews. Confession number two. We have turned a blind eye towards suffering, dismissing another's hurt and pain, crossing the street to avoid seeing need, ignoring the plight of the displaced and desperate, and confess, we have prepared a cross for our Savior. And now this 
this love of Christ shall flow like rivers come and wash your guilt away. This evening's third reading comes from Luke's gospel in chapter 23. It's found in verses 39 through 43. One of the criminals who were hanged there kept deriding him and saying, are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed have been condemned justly, for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus replied, truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. A moment this evening of relatively unscripted pastoral messaging in a pretty highly scripted service. Where do you see yourself among the thieves? Each of us, of course, has done our own wrongs, committed our own sins to be rightly condemned. And yet there he hangs in our place. On a dark evening like Good Friday, it seems fitting to remember the darkness of the cross at the end of a pretty dark year. It's been a hard year. A lot of loss and heaviness and uncertainty and pain and sickness and fear. A lot of the same emotions that were happening on Good Friday as Jesus and the thieves hung on the cross. But one of the things that I appreciated about this last year was being a part of the church and being in a position of preaching words of hope in the midst of a world losing hope. Being among people like you who held on to hope, who remembered a message of a God who still sits on a throne and is still sovereign and works things together for good, even when We don't see that good happening quite yet. This moment 
in Luke's gospel is a moment of light and hope and faith and trust in the midst of a lot of darkness and uncertainty. The thieves could have taken many roads, and we here too. And if you're like me, you've heard both of their voices within you at some point over this last year. God, what the heck are you doing? Or are you in this? Why the pain? What's the purpose of the suffering? Can't you just save us? Bring an end to this? Restore? And then I think in our better moments, we've been like the other thief. We're the ones who deserve the condemnation. Jesus went to the cross and had done nothing wrong. Lord, we look to you. Remember us. Don't give up on your people. Hang in there with us. We're hanging in with you. You're a good news people, and you've held on to good news well through a very difficult time. We're not out of the woods totally yet, and yet there's light, isn't there? You feel the hope? I think the thief, even in his darkest moments at the end of his life, rightly and justly condemned, felt the hope, felt the light, knew that he was close and that the source of his salvation was close to. And so may we be like that thief, even in the darkness of days that remain. May we look to Jesus instead of turning away from him. Even in our fear and our anger, may we hold him up as the Lord of life, as the hope of salvation. And may we allow Jesus' light to shine through us to be that source of hope and, and truth and grace in the lives of others who need that hope too. Hang in there, my friends, through this weekend, through the remainder of this season, he's still on the throne. Let's confess. We've kept silent when love demanded a response. Withholding kind words from one who craves compassion, excusing comments that diminish and disparage, shrinking in fear rather than speaking the truth in love. So now we cry out in response to Christ's heartbreaking lament, and we confess, we have prepared a cross for our Savior. Thank you.
Our fourth reading comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 19, verses 25 through 27. Standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to that disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. Our fourth confession. We have done too little to confront the evils of the world, denying the prejudice we carry and its power to harm, feigning powerlessness in the face of injustice, refusing to challenge systems that value some lives more than others. So now we stand ashamed before one unjustly condemned and we confess, we have prepared a cross for our Savior. Our faith reading comes from the book of Mark, chapter 15, verses 33 to 39. My God, why have you forsaken?
my apologies. Book, uh, the reading, the fifth reading is from Mark 15, uh, verses 33 to 39, the death of Jesus. When it was noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. At three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, listen, he's calling for Elijah. And someone ran, filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a stick and gave it to him to drink saying, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. Then Jesus gave a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now, when the centurion who stood facing him saw that, saw that in this way, he breathed his last, he said, truly this man was God's son. The fifth confession. We've, we have condoned violence in our nation and in our world watching weapon stockpiles grow as the vulnerable suffer, hearing news of violence with the silence of disinterested souls, standing by as your precious children fall wounded and torn. So now we behold you, your peers in bleeding body and confess we have prepared a cross for our savior. How deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that he should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure. How great the pain of searing loss. The Father turns his face away as wounds which mark the chosen one bring many sons to
Our sixth reading tonight is from the book of Luke, chapter 23, verses 44 to 49. It was now about noon, and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon, while the sun's light failed and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Then Jesus, crying with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. When the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God and said, Certainly, this man was innocent. And when all the crowds who had gathered there for this spectacle saw what had taken place, they returned home, beating their breasts. But all his acquaintances, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching these things. Sixth con confession. We have abandoned you and turned against one another, denying your claim on our lives, even in everyday choices, sowing division within the body of Christ rather than claiming others as our kin, betraying you by rejecting your shalom. So now we join your followers at the foot of your cross and confess we have prepared a cross for our Savior.
seventh reading is found in the Gospel of John, verses 38 to 42. Jesus is buried. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one because of his fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission, so he came and removed the body. Nicodemus, who had at first come to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about 100 pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with the spices in linen cloths, according to the burial custom of the Jews. Now, there was a garden in the place where he was crucified, and in the garden there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And so, because it was the Jewish day of preparation and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. The final confession. O Jesus, our suffering Lord, we have rejected you and the one who sent you. Setting a crown of thorns upon your head, mocking your humility with derision, condemning you to the death of a criminal. Forgive us. Redeem us. Renew us, we pray. We are distraught as we confess. We have prepared a cross for our Savior. Tremble, tremble.